you guys are all in for a major, major treat. I know you don't hear the word treat in economic, macroeconomic <laughs> and fiscal <laughs> policy too often in the same sentence, but um, you really are in for a major treat. Those of us who aren't economists sometimes, you know, see the charts and graphs and our eyes go fuzzy, but they're really going to explain this in a way that's going to um, be easy to grasp and easy to explain to other people. I worked as an employee of the Ministry of Health in Mozambique in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, what was called a cooperon. It's a very exciting time. And then two things happened. Two big things happened. One was a devastating war that was essentially a proxy war of South Africa, apartheid government against Mozambique, lasted until 1992, about the same time that Nelson Mandela was released from, from uh, prison. And the war had a hugely devastating effect because what they tried to do is they tried to devastate the government health system and the educational system that were responsible for the good reputation of the government. Health functioned in the towns and the cities, things still worked, but the war, the economy went into shambles. They couldn't produce sugar, they couldn't transport sugar or cotton or the things that they were producing, cashews. So Mozambique went into debt. And when they went into debt, what happened was that the international financial institutions came in and they said, and the, and the lenders said they wouldn't take anything, they wouldn't give any, any loans and to get Mozambique out of debt um, unless the IMF came in. And then they, they developed what was called PRE, PREI, and everybody in Mozambique knows what PREI is. It's the, the, um, the rehabilitation, economic rehabilitation program. Um, and that program basically slashed government budgets, uh, drops, uh, meaning that salaries dropped, maintenance ceased, uh, you didn't have fuel, you didn't have drugs. And then at the same time, when this was happening, there was another invasion, and that was the invasion of the aid agencies, um, organizations like our own, who came in with money from USAID, from other organizations, uh, other donors, and they came in and they created parallel systems of care, huge disparities with aid salaries, with per diems, with, uh, and sort of establishing a really different class of locals versus, uh, you know, sort of a local elite class paid by the donors and the NGOs. And so the, the people who are the health workers, and, you know, classic are the friends of ours, you know, who we've worked with for many, many years, say, uh, Florencia, a nurse who's worked, uh, as the, uh, who had worked as a provincial maternal child health director for a province of a million people, um, had earned, uh, had, had worked up to a salary of about $150 per month, which was a very reasonable salary in Mozambique at the time. Her salary went down to about an equivalent of $35 a month. And yet somebody who was reporting to her working for an aid agency would be earning something like $2,000 or $3,000 a month. The wages were non-living wages that the government was providing uh, because of a lot of the things you'll hear about today. You know, the prices went up. And people wouldn't come in for work. They started charging under the table. They started charging for drugs because they had to. They had to do it to support their families. It was just an incredibly difficult situation. And we were one of those aid agencies going in there, which I think a lot of you are in that situation. You're an aid agency. You're going in. You're supposed to be going in to support the government. You see it crumbling around you, and you're trying to replace this part and that part, but the government is just not you know, quite there. And it's not there because they're not funded or pieces are missing. Our colleagues on the ground are tremendously frustrated as to why, they, why governments can't spend more. So we started, we've been looking into these issues for quite a while. We've been very concerned about a host of World Bank reforms, IMF policy reforms for many years. You know, when, when structural adjustment hit in the 1980s and the government expenditures were cut way back, you saw a lot of the big NGOs like Oxfam, ActionAid, many others trying to jump in there and into the breach and fill, it, fill in for the state. Right, to sort of supplement or complement the retreating public services, public education, public health, agriculture services. And, and what critics like her and uh, Aaron Dottie Roy and many others were, were saying, they'd be like, look, you NGOs, you should st take a look at what you're doing here. Stop, stand back, realize, one, as NGOs, you're never going to fill the void left by the retreating public services. You're never going to be able to compensate or, 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 or replace public health systems, public education systems. You can play a, a complementary, supplementary role, but you're never going to be able to stand in for them and replace them. That's, one, that's most countries, right? That's one thing. Another thing is that by doing so, by jumping in and trying to like, be the bucket, bucket brigade instead of the fire department, you are, um, you are complicit, actually, in enabling this whole thing to go on and on. We managed to rebuild the health infrastructure. We've managed to rebuild health for, uh, uh, posts. We've managed to rebuild all those things caused by the war, but we haven't managed to get beyond the aid invasion and the structural adjustment program. And I would say right now, after now almost three decades of work in Mozambique, that the impact of the war is far less 
than the impact of structural adjustment and the impact of the aid invasion. And I think we need to understand that. There's lots of effort that our allies in the Global South are engaged in to try to get force their governments to spend more towards health. But partially what we're going to be talking about is what are the hydraulic pressures from the international system, much of it originated in U.S. policy, that's preventing our, our, uh, those governments or supporting their, their justification for not spending more on health. You're talking about the rich countries using leverage, leverage of aid dependency and, and to impose these policy changes. So it's like, yeah, we'll give you the foreign aid that we know you desperately need, but only if you make these economic policy reforms. Which was the structural adjustment uh, programs and policies of the 1980s that continued into the 90s, and then weirdly got changed into something called poverty reduction strategies. Now, how you get these policies that caused poverty and ill health, Ill health to be renamed their opposite is, is, is its own special story. In the last 15, 20 years, the Reagan-Thatcher uh, option of very tight uh, fiscal and monetary policy has come to be seen the one and only option. It's what we call the, what you may hear referred to as the Washington Consensus, that inflation must be pushed down to 5%, that deficits should be extremely low. In fact, you should pay down your deficit and build a surplus, if anything or have a balanced budget, but running up deficits, bad, you know, that's very bad. This is the logic that has been dominant for 25 years. Before leaving Ivory Coast, um, on that first trip, I remember coming back down and driving through Abidjan, which is the capital. It's a beautiful, beautiful city, really nice city. And there's this enormous slum that sits on the side of one of the hills of Abidjan, a relatively new slum. And I said, wow, that looks terrible, you know, and they said, the person who was with me said, that's called Washington. And I said, why is it called Washington? And they said, because that slum came about right after the structural adjustment programs came in, and everybody had to move to that slum. And they all knew what it was all about, because it was about the Washington Consensus. But that's the situation, is that there's just not a lot of discourse about that which is most important for your health workers overseas. And what's most surprising is that most of the discourse is outside of this country where those policies come from. But you guys as health activists, uh, you have to know about this. It's, it's, in, in, it's fundamental to ever getting success in, in, in global health. We know very, very little about what our government is doing that affects most of the world, but most of the world knows about it much more than we. I'm very pleased that we have an opportunity to address that gap in knowledge so that we as health workers doing health work overseas or we as global citizens can help impact our government and change the policies. Thank you.